we are concluding this uh, Money Matters series that we began earlier in the month, at the beginning of the month. And essentially what we've been focusing on was the idea that what you do with your money, how we uh, deal with our money and possessions, our financial life, really has a lot of implications on our faith, and they are to be one and the same. We don't have our work life over here, our church life over here, our financial life over here, and everything kind of distinct and separate. That what we do and who we are is really um, integrated into our faith journey, or should be integrated into our faith journey. I'm summarizing the series this morning, and we are uh, a little bit tight for time, and so I'm going to go through this message uh, more quickly than I normally would because you all may or may not recall that we are at the end of uh, this service. I'm going to just take a couple of minutes break, and then I'm going to present the findings for the Reveal Spiritual Life Survey that you all took um, a few months ago. And we're going to just kind of see where we are as a faith community and some ideas um, about where we go from here. I'm going to uh, summarize essentially um, the last few weeks, look at just a couple of highlight scriptures, and then really going to seek for uh, you to respond. We've been focusing on this idea for uh, about a month now, and it's sometimes it's just time for the um, media to stop and the music to stop and the teaching to stop and to just say it's time for you to stand before the Lord and respond in some way that you feel led. John Wesley was a man who you may or may not know um, was a reformer of the church. He's known as the founder of uh, Methodism because he had a very strong method in his teaching. He was very methodical in the way that people should grow in his faith. It is said that John Wesley accumulated um, about $30 million of earning in his lifetime. $30 million. At the end of his life, he had none of it. Because he lived by three financial principles. He taught these everywhere he went. He said, if you want to sum up the Bible's teaching on money, it's really this simple. Make all the money you can. Go out and make all the money you can. Save all the money you can. All the money that you can save, save. Give away all the money that you can. So go earn, save, and give it away. After John Rockefeller died, a multi-millionaire of his time, somebody asked his accountant, so how much money did he leave behind when he died? And the accountant said, all of it. He left it all behind when he died. You're not taking any of it with you. We forget that what we have is to be used to make a difference. That as people of faith, what we have is to make an impact in other people's lives. The little that you think you have is more than 90% of the world probably has. Will you stand so I can just offer a prayer as I begin? God, thank you for the gift of this day, for just allowing us to come together and to share who we are, to draw close to who you are, and to look at this important topic, money, finances, and deep faith. Hide me in your shadow so that what we see, what we sense, would not be me, but would be your presence. In Jesus' name, 
Amen. So I'm going to go through these first slides rather quickly. The first slide says that a couple of weeks ago, a few weeks ago, we talked about money matters and devotion. Luke 12, 34, where your treasure is, that's where your heart is. There's no greater indicator of your true values and priorities than what you do with your finances. The week after that, we talked about money matters and being debt-free. The rich rule the poor, the lender, the, bur the borrower is a servant to the lender. And so we talked about things like, how about, it, how about if we lived below our means? Most people want to live at their means, but I suggested to you that one of the ways we could grow and break this uh, endemic cycle of debt is to maybe live a little bit below our means. You can't be a life giver to other people if you are an enslaved borrower. And usually debt has to do with satisfying, satisfying some kind of instant gratification. Then last week I talked to you about money matters and discipline. Just highlighted Matthew 6.33. Seek first God's kingdom. That is not to say that you and what you need and what you value is unimportant. That is not to say that you don't need to earn a living and pay your bills. But if you are really going to be a person of faith, then you figure out ways in which you can focus on God and His agenda before you focus on you and yours. Materialism and debt continue to be some of the most constrictive forces in our society. We moan and groan about the government while we ourselves have a lot of red ink in our lives. And so being debt free is just this idea that we will not be enslaved to our finances. We will use our finances to make a difference in our lives and in the lives of those around us. And so this week it's called Money Matters, More Than Enough. And I would suggest to you that Money Matters, More Than Enough is really about the power of trust. The power of trust. You may or may not recall, I've shared this with you on numerous occasions, but the word faith and the word trust come from the same Latin root word. <coughs> When you have faith in someone, you trust them. If you have faith in your spouse, you trust your spouse. If your children ask to go somewhere to do something and you're not sure it's the best thing for them, they need to trust you and have faith in you that they might understand a little more. And conversely, if we have set the appropriate boundaries and foundation we learn to trust our children and have faith that they will make appropriate decisions. I would suggest to you that this is a key for churches. That if people in the pews, I know we have these like fancy seats, but you understand what I'm saying. If people do not trust the leadership of the church, then they should not give. We develop a sense of trust and relationship with each other. And I would suggest to you that one of the key components of growing a deep faith is, do I trust God enough to release my resources in the way that the Bible challenges me to, to make a difference in other people's lives? The next slide will share uh, three different passages of Scripture with you. We've looked at these passages of Scripture, so I'm just going to go through them very quickly. Malachi, last book in the Old Testament. Malachi was a prophet, he was a teacher, and there was one time when God was speaking to and through Malachi. And he says to Malachi these words. This is uh, chapter 3, beginning with the 6th verse. Malachi, I do not change. God's saying, listen, I, I'm, not, I don't, I'm not blown with the wind here. I don't change. My values are the same. My investment in human beings is the same. I value people. I value who they are. I do not change. And so he goes on to say, I want people to return to me. 
And the people respond legitimately, well, how should we return to you? That's a good question. What, what is it, God, exactly that you are asking of us? And then God's response. Should people rob me? What, how are we robbing you? You are robbing me in your tithes and offerings. All through the Old Testament, and I'll share with you in a, I'll share with you in a second, even in the New Testament, this emphasis on tithing, giving the first tenth, trying to figure out how to release into God's hands so that we can make a difference through the community of faith. It matters. What we do with our finances really matters. How are we robbing you? You're robbing me in your tithes and offerings. Bring the whole tithe and see if I do not bless you so much that you can't hold it. We would say the reverse. If I hold on to it, I, I know that I will have enough. I know that I will be blessed if I have enough. God is simply saying, can you trust me that what the community of faith can do multiplies what you can do individually? What you bring, you may not think of as very much. What you bring, you may not think of as very much. Simply put, we are stronger together. We are stronger when we are united together in purpose, in voice, in focus, in prayer, and yes, in finances. Can you, this verse is saying, can you trust God enough with that thing that grips our society so tightly. The money. The money. The other verse that you see up there is Luke chapter 12. I'm sorry, chapter 11. I put this in because people will often say, well, Jesus didn't teach tithing. That's an Old Testament thing. So, we're New Testament, we can keep our money. I don't quite say it that bluntly, but I want to share with you, Jesus very clearly taught tithing was a thing to do. Here, listen to this. This is Luke uh, chapter 3, I don't know what I'm talking about. Luke chapter 11, verse 42. Jesus is talking with the Pharisees. The Pharisees were the rulers at the time, and they were very strict followers of the letter of the law. Right? Kind of like people I just shared with you said, well, Jesus didn't teach tithing, so we don't need to tithe. That's why well, that's not right. Jesus is talking to the Pharisees, religious rulers, who kind of lorded their authority over people. And he says to you Pharisees, woe to you, because you give a tenth. That's a tithe. You give a tenth to God of your mint, your rue, and all other kinds of garden herbs. You following this? He's saying to you, you give a tenth of the tomatoes that you raise. You give a tenth of your garden. And that's good. But then Jesus goes on to say, but you neglect justice and you don't love God. You should have practiced the latter, justice and loving God, without leaving the former undone. Jesus clearly lining out, listen, tithing is not buying your way into God's favor. Just because you're tithing doesn't mean you can uh, neglect people. You need to be about financial accountability, but you also need to love people and love God and serve other people. So tithing is not a law way of buying God's favor. But Jesus says, yes, you should tithe. 
and love God. It's not one or the other. Tithing does not equal rules. Tithing equals trusting and investing in God's purposes. Bring your financial life to the foot of the cross is saying, I trust you enough, I'm going to invest in your kingdom enough so that it makes a difference in people's lives because it is made here. It has made such a difference in my life. If God is not reorienting your life, don't tithe just to earn His blessing. I've never seen that happen. And then the last verse up there, Matthew 25, 14, 30, is that story. Remember that story I shared with you last week? It was the idea that you take these five talents and you invest them and grow them. You take these two talents and you invest them and you grow them. And the one guy, remember, he got one talent. You remember what he did with this? What did he do with his one talent? He buried it in the ground because he was afraid to make an investment. And I would suggest to you the moral of that story is that investing in God's kingdom is never a safe thing to do. If you are seeking safety, then run away from God quickly. If you are seeking to make a difference in people's lives and for your life to be strengthened, then run toward God quickly. Your choice. One of my favorite verses is this next slide, Galatians 5.1. It is for freedom that Christ has set you free. Stand firm then, and do not let yourselves be burdened again by the yoke of slavery. Don't let yourselves be burdened by anything. What is a yoke? A yoke, that is some, a yoke is something that goes around your neck and takes you places where you may not want to go. A yoke burdens you. That sounds a lot like some of our financial world, doesn't it? Burdened, consuming and taking us where we don't want to go. Doesn't our financial world sometimes take us where we don't want to go? Debt, fears of the future, anxiety about will I have enough? I'm not sure I'm going to have enough. Galatians is saying, God didn't set you free so that you could be burdened by something. Finances, an abusive marriage, broken relationships. God did not set you free so that you could be yoked to something that is burdensome. He set you free to be yoked together to Christ. There's this little passage in 1 Peter 5.8. I'll share it with you. Love this. 1 Peter, these words. Be very alert and have your mind sharp at all times. Because your enemy prowls around like a roaring lion, looking to snatch you. What does that mean? It means that the enemy is always trying to get us off track. Most of us think that's kind of like the movie The Exorcist. Our head's going to spin around and pea soup's coming out. The most powerful weapon to take somebody off track is not to take them way off track. It's just to nudge them just a little bit. Because if I'm trying to walk toward God right here, the enemy doesn't need to take me over there, he just needs to take me there. Broken finances will do that. That's it. That's it for this morning.
Now it's your turn. For a few weeks now, I've been just kind of sharing with you a little bit of what it means to live a scripturally based, faithful life with your finances. Nothing fancy, nothing really that deep. But I now place the response in your hands where it should be. I cannot read your Bibles for you. I cannot tithe for you. I cannot pray for you. <laughs> the leadership of the church just tries to teach and guide, challenge, correct. But then, even as Jesus did, leave the response in your hands. This last slide simply says that what we are about now is the power of prayer and the power of unity. Let me tell you what we're going to do. For those of you that have journeyed with New Song and you have journeyed with us through this series, it is time to take some action. It is time for me just to say to you, what say you? How shall you respond to the scriptural teaching on finances and money? I'm going to ask that the camera be turned off in just a second. But let me say to anyone who may be watching this on YouTube later that this church is really not about money. That it is about figuring out how to free people from the grip of financial pain. And so if you are living that kind of life, know that New Song will pray for you. And know that you will pray for each other. So at this time, I'm going to ask that the camera be turned off because this is a really a personal time of response. <clears throat>